I am so glad you're here because today we're expanding on our knowledge of amino acids to talk about how to synthesize peptides, which we know are the backbones of proteins. Specifically, we're going to be looking at methods for amid bond formation, protecting groups, and solid phase peptide synthesis. And make sure you stick around to the end because I have some practice problems that should help on your next exam. Peptides are composed of amino acids, which we have reviewed in a previous video. Specifically, there is a carboxylic acid, and at the alpha carbon position is a hydrogen, an amine, and an R group side chain. Listed are three different amino acids, serine, cysteine, and glycine. Notice that glycine doesn't have a chiral alpha carbon, and this is because both the other substituents on the carbon atom are hydrogen atoms. Now these different amino acids can come together and form what are called peptide bonds, or what we commonly know them as amide bonds. For this specific peptide, we're gonna look at combining these three different amino acids sequentially from left to right. The amide bond is formed from the amine functional group on one amino acid and the carboxylic acid on another amino acid. So if we were to draw this specifically for these three different amino acids, what we would have is we would start to form our chain. And again, here, the carboxylic acid has now turned into an amide. So what I need to draw now is what would happen if this amine group had formed an amide at this carboxyl group on the serine. So from here, I can begin to draw this by placing my cysteine side chain as a wedge going in the upward direction. Here, I know that there's a hydrogen atom, which I could draw in or just leave blank like I did on this amino acid. And then from here, I know that I have another amide bond. So for this reason, I would draw in my carboxyl or carbonyl functional group, followed again by my new amide, which is formed from glycine. And from here, I know that I have finally terminated at the carboxyl group. And again, remember, there are two hydrogens for glycine. And notice that specifically for peptides, we always go from the N terminus, the N terminus, to the C terminus. And this is the way peptides are always drawn from left to right from the N terminus to the C terminus. And we call them the N terminus because on this end we have the primary amine functional group. And on the C terminus we have this carboxyl group. So in this specific peptide, I would say that I have the serine amino acid, I have the cysteine amino acid, and then I also have the glycine amino acid. Oftentimes, you will see amino acid structures written out as their three letter components or even their one letter components. So in that case, it would be S, C, G for serine, cysteine, glycine, indicating that this is the peptide that has formed via these specific peptide bonds that are formed between these different amino acids. In a previous video, which I'll link here, we've talked about amide bond formation from carboxylic acids. Importantly, we need to use a coupling agent in order to achieve this new functional group. On the screen, you'll see the structure of one such coupling agent called dicyclohexyl carbo diimide. Importantly, we can just shorten that tongue twister into DCC. And we can actually abbreviate this even further by just drawing in R groups for the cyclohexyls in order to indicate that this is DCC. The mechanism of this coupling reaction occurs first via proton transfer, where the DCC can act as a base and deprotonate the carboxylic acid. This is in turn going to form a carbamate which can further react. Importantly, we still have our protonated DCC, which has been formed over the course of this reaction. And notice that there is now a very electrophilic carbon, which can be attacked by the newly formed nucleophile or that carboxylate group. This moves the pi electrons to the nitrogen atom, allowing us to generate a neutral species. The intermediate that is formed is now going to be a combination of these two molecules, where on this carbon, we now have the rest of our DCC, but we also have the carbon to oxygen bond that is formed over the course of this reaction. Our second amino acid, remember, has an amino group, which is nucleophilic, and can now come in and attack the carboxyl group kicking up the electrons to the oxygen, forming a tetrahedral intermediate, which we can draw like this. Remember, we still have our oxygen to carbon bond with the portion of our diimid that has been protonated. And now we have this tetrahedral carbon 
through the attachment of our second amino acid, whatever it was. From here, these lone pair electrons can come down and kick off the DCC modified molecule, allowing us to form our new amide bond. At this stage, we now have a protonated amide at this position, which is still able to be deprotonated further by some sort of base or some other compound, for example, like the intermediate that was formed here, where we would have formed that negatively charged oxygen that can come in and deprotonate that proton to allow us to generate our neutral amide bond, and finally our peptide bond. Now imagine we wanted to form a dipeptide between cysteine and serine. Now, an important question that you should be asking yourself is what is stopping two cysteine or two serine amino acids from doing a homocoupling with one another? Because each of these amino acids contains an amine and a carboxyl group, and there actually is nothing that would stop these from doing a homocoupling instead of doing a cross-coupling between the two different amino acids. To alleviate this concern, in order to do peptide synthesis, we need to consider something called protecting groups, where we can place groups on the amine functional group or on the carboxyl functional group in order to protect one side or the other to allow this cross-coupling to occur. The two most commonly used protecting groups are going to be BOC or BOC or FMOC, FMOC. BOC stands for tert-butoxy-carbonyl, and FMOC stands for fluorinyl methoxyl carbonyl. Notice that this portion is just our amino acid structure, which has been modified by some special starting material. Both of those starting materials are drawn here. Importantly, when you add both of these reagents to an amino acid, they form an amide bond, allowing us to protect the amine group on each side. What follows is the mechanism for Bach protection. First, the amino group functions as a nucleophile and attacks the carbonyl group. The carbonyl group is reformed, ejecting a resonance-stabilized leaving group. Finally, the ammonium ion is deprotonated, yielding the protected amino acid. Importantly, once we have protected these amino acids, Following coupling to form our new peptide, we need to be able to remove those protecting groups. The mechanism for that transformation is here. The carbonyl group is protonated by trifluoroacetic acid. Next, the carbamic acid functions as a leaving group. From here, the trifluoroacetate that was formed in the first step removes a proton from the carbamic acid. Next, a proton transfer is, is accompanied by loss of carbon dioxide. In Merrifield synthesis, peptides are synthesized through solid phase peptide synthesis, or SPPS for short. This method revolutionized peptide synthesis by enabling the stepwise assembly of peptides on a solid support, which is typically a resin bead, like a polymer. The process begins with the attachment of the C-terminal amino acid to the resin via a linker. Then, each subsequent amino acid is added one at a time, with the peptide growing in the c to N direction, allowing it to react with the amino group of the growing peptide chain. After each coupling step, the resin is washed to remove any unreacted reagents. Cleavage from the resin and removal of the protecting groups yield the desired peptide. Now let's try some practice problems to gauge your understanding. Pause the video, try the problems independently, then resume the video to check my explanation. The easiest way to begin drawing peptides is to start with recognizing that we work from the N-terminus to eventually the C-terminus. So remember, this is the N-terminus, and we will attach it to the alpha carbon, which is going to contain some side chain, which we'll wait to put in. And then we're going to contain our carboxyl group, which now has been formed into an amide from the original carboxylic acid, which means I need to place the NH. And remember that nitrogen actually came from the amine terminus of the next amino acid, which means that the alpha carbon will be at this position, which then means that the next side chain will be going downwards. And then I will draw in my carboxyl group, which again has now been turned into an amide from the amine of our final amino acid. So therefore, this is going to be the location, the next R group will go in the upwards direction, and then we will complete this peptide by drawing in our carboxyl group. So now we have completed from N terminus to C terminus with our three different amino acids, and now we can start to populate this and figure out the stereochemistry. Now we can go in and start to populate our R groups. So the first one was phenylalanine, which is actually going to be a CH2 group followed by a benzene ring, and that gives us our phenylalanine. The next one, remember, is going in the downward direction, and it's valine. Valine is just this group right here, this isopropyl group, and the three-letter abbreviation for that is VAL. And then the final functional group that we need to add is going to be the tryptophan. Tryptophan has a fused ring structure, which is actually a heterocycle, 
in that it contains a nitrogen at one of the carbons. So we can draw this in by making sure that we have a fully conjugated system. And remember that the NH exists as well, which also has a lone pair if you wanted to draw all that in. And again, that's tryptophan, which is TRP. The last thing we need to do is indicate the stereochemistry. Remember that all amino acids have S stereochemistry, except for cysteine, which actually has R. So we can go in here and try to identify how we can get S orientation. So the nitrogen amino group will take priority as position one, the carbonyl group will be position two, and then the phenylalanine substituent will actually take position three. So in order to go in this direction, going from one, two, three, I see that that's counterclockwise, which means that this should be drawn as a wedge coming out at you because this keeps our counterclockwise rotation, giving us the S configuration. For valine, again, the amine from the amide is priority number one, the carboxyl group is priority number three, and the amino acid valine is priority, or sorry, the carboxyl group is priority number two, and the valine is priority number three. So in order for us to go counterclockwise, because currently it's going one, two, three in a clockwise fashion, in order for that to occur, remember I need to draw this in as a dashed line, indicating that baling is coming back. And then finally, we can do tryptophan, where the again, the nitrogen takes priority one, the carboxyl group is priority two, and the tryptophan substituent is going to be priority number three. And notice that again, this one is already going one, two, three counterclockwise, which means I can just draw this in as a wedge, coming out at you because nothing needs to flip. And this is going to be the correct way to draw this specific peptide, phenylalanine, valine, tryptophan, using the correct stereochemistry. Previously in this video, we covered how the mechanism works for the deprotection of a Bach protecting group. This example is how you deprotect the FMOC protecting group. Using a nucleophilic base, we can deprotonate this hydrogen generating a brand new carbanion species. From here, we generate an intermediate and our protonated pyridine. So remember, we have added this extra hydrogen here, so now this is a positively charged papyridine, and I have a carbanion that is newly formed here. At this stage, several steps can occur in concert, allowing us to generate a species where we are creating the final products, which actually contain our newly formed amine for our deprotected amino acid, as well, as a group that has now left from this piece where we've actually formed a brand new alkene. And that alkene structure looks like this. And importantly, has left behind our deprotected amino acid, which can now further react with other amino acids to generate our fully formed peptide. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you have any questions about this video or anything else related to chemistry, drop it as a comment down below and I'll be happy to help you out. I'll see you in the next video.